All right, everyone, welcome back. We're going to move into our panel discussion today, uh, which is titled Perspectives on Measurement in Early Childhood. I will be introducing our moderator for the panel, Dr. Joan Lombardi, and then Joan will be introducing the panelists as they speak. So briefly, Joan, our, the moderator of our panel, is the Director of Early Opportunities, a strategic advisement service focused on the development of young children, families, and communities. In addition, she is senior scholar at the Center for Child and Human Development at Georgetown University. Joan previously served as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Early Childhood during the Obama administration. And over almost uh, 50 years now, Joan has made significant contributions in the areas of child and family policy. And as an innovative leader, uh, national advisor, um, international advisor as well for, found and for organizations and foundations. Uh, on a personal note, Joan is one of the most dedicated and hardworking people I know in, in the early childhood field. Her days span starting so she can get on co calls in Europe and Africa early in the morning, all the way into the evenings for on the West Coast. So I truly appreciate Joan, you moderating the panel for today and I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you so much, Tyson. I, I, I must say the days have been long, but lately they seem, um, to be very exciting. And I want to thank you, first of all, Tyson and Phil. What you're about to launch here is so important for the field. And there's been so much misinformation that uh, I think all of us that are listening can't thank you enough. And I, I, if, if some of you are just joining us, if you didn't hear the first portion where Portia Kennel spoke, I really urge you to listen. Um, Portia, thank you for those words of wisdom. I could tell in the chat um, that people were responding so enthusiastically. You gave us so much food for thought on a topic that has seemed to dominate both programs and policies. And I was struck listening to you um, with how positive on one hand the field is about research. They've really come a long way in, in having a more accepting orientation to a set of situations where they haven't been asked and they have been undervalued in bringing their perspective to the discussion. So you really underscored how important it is that we move to a new way of thinking, an asset-based system, um, taking it out of the gotcha mentality and really uh, moving towards a more formative assessment. Uh, I'm going to introduce our panel. This initiative is going to help us sort out uh, the information that we need on the appropriate use of assessment. And we have a lot to sort out. The difference between developmental assessment used in a pediatric office and formative assessment in a preschool classroom and how these efforts work together. Moreover, <coughs> a new set of measures emerging that are, in, that are important to tracking our progress at the community level, at the population level, that I think maybe may help us uh, address some of the issues that uh, Portia outlined. But we have a lot to do. Measurement is not the goal. Measurement is a tool towards our goal. And we have to keep reminding us of that. So we have a terrific panel of four. And let me introduce all four of them and then <clears throat> ask each of them to reflect on their own experiences and what they heard in Portia's remarks. Uh, we're gonna first hear from <clears throat> Dr. Uh, Ioma Aruka, who's a research professor at the Department of Public Policy and a fellow at the F FPG uh, Child Development Institute at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. After her three year plus experience as a Chief Research and Innovation Officer and the Director of the Center for Early Education Research and Evaluation at the High Scope Foundation. Uh, Ioma, the state of North Carolina is lucky that you just moved down there, back there. And uh, we really are all grateful for the work that you're doing around an array of issues, especially equity across the country. We're then gonna hear from uh, Stephanie DeAnda who's a assistant professor in communication disorders and sciences at the University of Oregon. Dr. DeAnda is a licensed speech 
and language pathologist and has published scientific articles focused on single and dual language learning infants and toddlers in Mexico, the US and Canada. And Stephanie, we are so grateful that you are raising the issues of dual language learning, which is an issue that should be on the minds of every program director in the country. We'll also hear from um, Jason Gordney. He currently serves as the Interim Chief Executive Officer at Amara, a nonprofit organization serving children and families experiencing child welfare and adoption in the Puget Sound region. He has more than 20 years of experience in child welfare and early childhood programs with a strong focus on supporting families impacted by poverty, systemic bias, and trauma. And Jason, we are just so grateful that you're bringing together child welfare and early childhood who are natural allies on the same side. And then, of course, finally, we'll hear from Dr. Phil Fisher, and I'm so honored to be on the panel with him. Phil and I've got to know each other in my role as the chair of his national advisory for the RAPID study. He's the director, as you know, of the University of Oregon Center for Translational Neuroscience, and his research and his reach are just enormous. So thanks, Phil, for coming back to be on the panel. Let me turn it to Yoma, to Dr. Ruka, for your initial thoughts. And I know you have a limited time, so we're just thrilled that you could be with us today. Yoma. Thank you, Joan. Can you hear me? So good to be here. Um, I'm, you know, when Joan sort of moderates, you just do what she says. So I'm very pleased to be here and with, with uh, Stephanie, Jason, and Phil. And, and so I just look forward to our continued conversation. So. I would say that as somebody who really thinks about issues of equity, racial equity specifically for young children and families and, and sort of both at the program level and systems level, I, I take away a couple of things from Portia. And, and I wanna sort of, I, as she was talking, the one thing that came to my head was um, Chimanda Adichie's uh, uh, TED talk, right? That says the, the, um, the risk of a single story. And I feel like that was kind of the, the, some of the things that I sort of just heard is that, you know, measurement is so important and being able to, to identify measures, um, to being able to identify measures that really help to tell the full story of programs, of children, of families, of systems are really critically important that we just can't take sort of one slice, one measure, say, this is who you are. This is literally, you are all, but this one score on the class and this is good or bad who you are. And so the danger really of a single story is something that I think really resonated with me. And I would say as somebody who studies really, you know, families um, and thinking particularly from the racial equity lens that certain groups of families are often positioned as less than, not doing enough, children aren't ready, so early child has to come and save the day. So the single story about families and that we need to do more to really make sure we have measures and tools that really tell the full story. Like, what does it mean? So just somebody like me, a mother of two children in the early childhood world in the midst of COVID and in the midst of racial, you know, injustice and awareness. Like, what is that, what is the story being told and what are the measures and the tools that programs and schools can use to make sure that somebody like me or, or the people are being supported supported in the best way possible. And then the third thing I want, I, I feel like I really took away and I think very much in line with what I think through is sort of this idea of asset-based framing, right? Like, of course, we want to talk about the needs that families, children, programs have, but it's always easy to talk about the needs and never what are the assets that exist. And so I think, you know, you know, Portia really, I think, brought that forward as we think about, you know, tools um, and how to continue to do continuous quality improvement, that we think about the assets that many, many things, many people programs have, and that by ignoring the, the all the things that are possible and focusing on all the things that are not there, we again tell a single story about your program is bad, your family is bad, and this child is stupid. Like that is not what we want to position. And so being able to have a, a way to, 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 and that's why I, I think I really love sort of the prism sort of uh, uh, approach that, you know, Phil Tyson and team took is really to examine measurement in a way, in tools at least, in a way that captures the nuances and the different stories that we're trying to tell um, and that the tools are being used in different ways and how can we at least capture the strength of tools and be able to balance it in a, in a meaningful way. So I took so much out of Portia's, uh, uh, I think, keynote and I think I hope that others did as well. 
Um, um, Ilma, before you have to move on, I, I'm just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about, you know, what's the advice you give to programs when they're looking to measure their impact? I mean, you spent your life on this. <laughs> you know, what have you learned about, you know, the do's and don'ts of this? Because so many people are struggling with this. Thank you. And I'm with you for like 25 minutes, so don't throw me out yet. Um, <laughs> um, I, I would say that for, to me, some of the some of the some of the don'ts is literally like don't tell a single story one tool. I think it, it's trying to. I think that's key number one. So take that. Don't tell you know the risk of a of a single story. Um, and the second one is is actually bring it. I would argue it's actually bring in the end user. Right, so I feel like both being at you know UNC and also then being at high school, which is really known for the para preschool study, but really about how do we support the workforce and programs, is that we have to actually bring the end user, like whoever the end user, we have to actually include them because as researchers, you know, we come from a different lens, we see things a little differently, good or bad, but if we're not actually bringing into sort of the, the, the leaning in on the strength of those on the ground and really doing the work and really probably. No, not probably. Definitely no more. No more than most of us researchers in, in the Eiffel Tower in the Ivory Tower. Then I think we're making a mistake. I, th I think part of the is to actually lean in on those and actually go through this level of co-construction. I think whenever possible, right? Measurement and tool development is not for the faint of heart. It is not easy, no matter what we try to do. But if there's a way to really do more of the co-creation, at least minimally, at least says, hey, end user, hey, family members, hey, program directors, hey, teachers, you know, let's interpret this information. Let's interpret these indicators. How do you read it? And I think the best tools that we see are those that have at least done some of that level of work that does take time. And, you know, speaking to maybe Stephanie would talk about this, speaking to those who may speak a different language or even a different dialect of English, because there's a lot of us who speak a different dialect of English, to, to make sure that even things that we think are simple, right, like simple words, like the, on the PBI picture vocabulary, literally they mean different things in different communities. So being able to actually make sure that we are at least uh, bringing those who are most going to benefit to be part of that process, I think is, is critically important. And then I would say probably the third thing I would just add to that list is that we have to sort of challenge our notion about what are we measuring, right? Many a times we're like, we're measuring family engagement, like to one of Portia's sort of key, like calling card is to, you know, do more family engagement. But we have to question, what is family engagement? Who gets to decide what it is? What does it look like, right? And whose standards are we using? So I think with anything about tool, tool development, it's to really interrogate who leads that conversation, who drives the conversation, who drives the development. And from a racial equity lens, we at least know for most of our tools, they were not developed for or by many people of color or those who have linguistic, you know, who are linguistically diverse. So we have to actually in some ways begin to really go back and say, who was developed, who who, who developed this on the what theory, um, who was part of it. So I think we just have to do some interrogation, even of our best tools, not to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but we should do some interrogation to just make sure that we have not left certain groups behind, certain cultures behind, certain assets behind, because I think unfortunately we have a because we position many people, at least in early childhood, as needing something, as opposed to bringing something in addition to needing something. So those will be kind of some of my key um, thoughts. What, what words of wisdom? I mean, I, I, I think we should have a slogan with this whole initiative that says, we don't tell a single story. <clears throat> it's, a great, it's a great message. And you know what's great about the audience, I, we've done a little look at who's listening today. And, What's exciting is we've got researchers and practitioners listening together. And I think that's the co-construction that you're, that you're after, Ioma. Well, let me turn to Stephanie and uh, you, know, you have so much experience, particularly around these dual language issues. What, what, what are your reflections, Stephanie, in, in your own work and in what you heard this uh, a little while ago from, from uh, Portia? Yeah, I prepared a few bullets and, and it's funny because um, many of the things I'm going to share here in a second of my reflections were 100% things we just heard from both Portia and Ioma. So um, I'm going to just talk about these a little bit and you'll see what I mean here. Um, like you just said, Joan, I, I, um, I'm in the Communication Disorders and Sciences Department, so that means that I'm training speech and language pathologists to help diagnose and treat kids that are struggling with speech and language issues. And then as a researcher with that hat on, I, I work at the Early Dual Language Development Lab where we're actually 
trying to develop interventions to serve children from Latinx communities who are learning often in languages in place of or in addition to English. And in starting that work, what what um, what I what we came across is is that. Uh, to develop interventions, we had to really start from square one and develop tools to, to not only uh, identify the children that needed our support, but also to help um, track their progress and measure success as we've been talking about. And so we know that language and communication concerns are the overwhelming reason kids um, get referred to um, early special education services. And um, Therefore, we really need good measures that are centered on language and communication. Um, but what we've learned, unfortunately, is um, that we don't have the appropriate tools for these vulnerable families. Full stop. I mean, in, in my field of speech and language pathology, um, we have few available tools for kids that don't speak English or multilingual families. Um, and, and this is not just unique to Latinx children. Our measures are often centered overwhelmingly on English and English monolingual. Also, so not just you know a measure that's um, you know a lot of kids are learning English in this country, but uh, but but many of them are learning them in in multilingual contexts, and that actually presents a whole other uh, learning um, environment. And so um, for for even and even as uh, Yoma just talked about moments ago, um, even kids learning English, we aren't doing a good job of describing the dialectical variability. We've underserved historically as speech language pathologists, kids learning African-American English. In fact, we've used terminology that pathologizes um, the, uh, a totally typical dialect used in the United States. So in the absence of these measures, we're often left making the same mistakes as Portia was talking about some moments ago, that we were using tools intended often for English speakers or for white children, and then examining and using them with more diverse families for whom these measures were never created for and they're frankly inappropriate. Um, and so, and to Portia's point, what happens is then we end up, we use these inappropriate tools and then we end up looking at these children as a deficit because we're using constructs that are actually um, relevant in, 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 their, in their context. So my hope is that um, this, the impact repository tool is, is doing a couple things for us. I think it's got a lot of uh, excellent potential, but there's two things that I want to highlight. One, I'm hoping that, um, this, this tool helps us think critically and carefully about the ways in which we measure what success means in linguistically and culturally diverse children. So it's pushing us to think in a multidimensional way, critically about all the different things that a particular tool can bring. And I think others have mentioned that point as well. And two, just the simple act of bringing together and having a repository of se several measures helps us see where these gaps are, right? Because we can actually kind of put these together and go in and say, hey, I don't have a measure for this. Um, so I'm also hoping that just from a really practical perspective, it really clarifies where these gaps are and that, that then that pushes us to create measures, as Portia said, that are not just um, for these children, but are created with these families as well. Um, so that we're not just going into these communities and creating them and deciding what success means for them. And, and I'll, I'll end with this final thing. Um, Portia also mentioned the importance of, of having diverse perspectives at the table. So not just the families, but us as researchers. And so I'll share a little bit because um, it, 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 it might not be a surprise to all of you that my overwhelming focus on the Latinx and dual language learning community is because that's who I am. I'm a Latina, my first language was Spanish. And, and so these issues are personal to me. So I'll just share a little anecdote and, I'll, and then I can turn it over to you. But um, as, a, as a child of Mexican immigrants, when I started school, I only spoke Spanish, no English at all. I was, I was um, only hearing Spanish at home. I, uh, so it was only until I really started school that English was, I was exposed a, a lot to English. And at that time, as I was growing up in California, uh, bilingual education was supported. So um, I was going back through some years ago through papers my mother had saved and uh, from, from that time. And I, I actually found assessments um, that were actually in both Spanish and English. And I learned to read in Spanish first, um, well before I learned to read in English. And so I think back, um, you know, since then, um, they actually, if, if I would have been born a few years later, uh, California would not have had bilingual education anymore. There was a period of time where that wasn't the case and there was English only instruction. So I think about those children during that time and many others for whom this is still true, you know, would, would my Spanish have been measured and would it have been seen as a strength to be leveraged? Would it have been measured at all? And I, I don't know the answer to that, right? But what I, I do know is that I feel hopeful by having these conversations that we're centering the voices of children who are growing up, learning more than one language beyond just English, like many in, in my Latinx community. Because I, I really believe that, that these measures hopefully in the future will reflect every part of who we are. 
Well, Stephanie, you you have such a hopeful message, and I, you know, as someone who grew up also with the immigrant parent, um, we it during an era where the goal was to learn English only um, and losing your home language. You know, I can tell you, we need a much more hopeful message. And I want to come back to you later about your comment about what success means and how we marry together the measure with our goal, because sometimes there's a mismatch and that's the problem. But before I come back to you, let's hear from Jason. Um, you have so much experience, particularly with the child welfare system and, and which, you know, unfortunately has had some, sometimes not the most positive use of measurement um, and assessment. Uh, that leads to important impacts on children. So Jason, take it away. Thanks, Joan. Um, and I just want to uh, quickly say, you know, I am on Zoom calls all day long, all week long, and it's not until it's like my time to present on this webinar that my Wi-Fi just decided to drop about five minutes ago. So I, I am back on. If it drops again, I promise I'll be back. I'll just switch over to my cell phone. So if um, those are, you know, those are just the kinds we're, we're of... With you. We're with you, Jason. We've all gone... Yeah, you know, perf perfect timing. Um, so anyway, thank you very much. Um, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's really an honor to be here with the other speakers and other panelists today. And my wheels are really spinning and listening to, um, to other folks' uh, perspectives and comments. Um, so I'm gonna give a, a kind of a high level summary of just some issues that I've noted in my experience related to, to evaluation, um, working with, really a variety of early childhood and infant mental health programs over a number of years. Um, so I, earlier in my career, I was in child welfare. I sort of took a 12 year break or so and uh, went into early childhood programming in a big way. And I've recently come back to child welfare. So I'm gonna focus really on my early, child, uh, uh, early childhood experience. Um, so when I entered the field um, of early childhood programming, it was really in the context of evidence-based programs. So um, those are programs that were funded through um, primarily through public dollars at sort of all levels. So federal, state, county, city, sometimes through, um, you know, private foundations. Um, and in these programs, evaluation was generally driven by funders and by program developers. Um, so I just want to underline um, what, what uh, Portia said earlier that, um, that, that measures um, were, were not, did not include participation, Select, se selection of measures did not include participation from families and communities. Um, and I just couldn't agree more that they should have been and they should now be at the table and should continue to be at the table in determining what's important to evaluate and how to evaluate that in these programs. Um, so having said that, um, when I came into the field, evaluation was really focused on kind of three things. One was fidelity um, uh, to the of implementation. One was outputs and the other was outcomes. So fidelity meaning are we implementing in the way that the program was designed to operate? Are we sort of following the recipe um, that was prescribed, in other words? Um, outputs, meaning, you know, how many kids and families were recruited, how many completed the program, how many home visits were provided, those kinds of things. Um, outcomes were either measured by evaluation tools that were sort of built into the program models. Um, uh, by the developers and, and were sort of unique and proprietary to those programs. Um, there was sometimes flexibility to choose evaluation tools um, to, you know, to measure things like child development, for example. But um, so there's not a lot of flexibility when I came in around what tools to use. Um, so I'd like to just mention a couple of consequences of that approach to evaluation. Um, one of those is um, it was really difficult to, to sort of compare the relative effectiveness of um, different programs. So I was at an organization that offered like three different home visiting models, um, and we weren't using the same evaluation tools across programs. Um, and most of those programs had very similar eligibility requirements, and it was really hard to know like how to direct families to which program because um, we were using sort of different measurement tools. They were sort of aimed at different things, and we just didn't have ways to kind of uh, 
to have data help guide us around who was most likely to um, get benefits from, from which of those models. Um, so I would say more broadly, it also sort of set up, uh, I guess, an unintended incentive structure for, uh, for organizations like mine um, that could be problematic. You know, organizations were really incentivized to provide um, services, you know, to, to, to the number of participants that they were sort of being funded to serve um, and, and then to, you know, kind of show that they were getting the outcomes that they were supposed to get, right? So if you're implementing an evidence-based program, um, you should get the results because it works, right? Um, so, you know, if they don't work, uh, then, it, you know, you must be doing something wrong. And I think others have sort of called attention to that, uh, that tension already. Um, one of the things that I, that I noticed was that sometimes uh, the evidence-based models may have been developed and tested in one cultural context, um, and now they were being applied in a completely different cultural context with, um, you know, really different uptake and enthusiasm from uh, sort of different communities, depending on how relevant, um, you know, those services uh, were, those programs were to those communities. Um, sometimes that could be positive, you know, some communities really responded, sometimes it was negative, they just didn't find it relevant. Um, I think the models that had the flexibility to adapt to the local context um, and were delivered by community members tended to be the most popular um, and sort of have the kind of best outputs and, um, and outcomes. Um, so, you know, I think unfortunately another unintended consequence of evaluation can be it can create incentives for organizations that are, um, are funded to provide these models to um, recruit those who are going to be most likely to succeed. Um, maybe not those most in need of support at times. Um, I think another really important point about those programs, um, you know, in my experience was that, that we didn't really have a, a lot of clarity and precision around sort of what the mechanisms of change were. Um, so there was an expectation to implement the program to fidelity. Um, and then the assumption was that it was work, that it would work, but we weren't necessarily measuring how the program activities were leading to change um, in most cases. And I think that limited our ability to learn and improve. Okay, so um, I wanna just kind of shift a little bit um, to something that I, that I was very influenced by and I've seen be very influential in the field. And that is sort of when awareness began to grow about the body of research that the Center on the Developing Child was promoting, um, I think we began to realize that we weren't actually measuring um, a lot of uh, sort of what were the key ingredients that were most likely to be leading to um, positive changes. So those sort of three principles that the, that the, that the Center on the, on the Developing Child has been promoting around reducing sources of stress on families, um, promoting responsive relationships between adults and children and adults and adults in children's lives and strengthening core skills in kids and adults um, who care for them. Um, we sort of looked at our programs and realized, well, we're doing a lot of those things, or we think we're doing a lot of those things, but we aren't actually measuring and tracking progress on most of those things. Um, and, and I will just call special attention to the, the stress of, of racism and experienced racism for the families we were serving. Um, we certainly weren't paying enough attention to the impact of, of that. Um, and, and that's something we need to get better at. Um, so another part of my work was not just implementing these evidence-based programs, but I really had the um, opportunity to be involved with the Frontiers of Innovation Initiative uh, in partnership with the Center on the Developing Child in the state of Washington going back to 2011. Um, and really the goal of that initiative was to take these kind of principles that, that research had shown, you know, were the things that, that supported healthy child development and look for ways that we might sort of um, modify or add components to existing programs to make them sort of more impactful and more effective. So we ended up partnering with um, just a number of researchers from around the country to test out um, some new approaches that were grounded in, in that research um, in our existing evidence-based programs. And, you know, in working with researchers and developing evaluation plans for, for some of the pilot testing that we did uh, around that, 
I think we learned some important lessons about real world evaluation. I just wanted to share a few of those. Um, one of those, and people have already brought it up today, so I won't spend a lot of time on it, is that linguistic and cultural relevance is just critical. Um, you know, we were serving just an a incredibly diverse array of families here in the Puget Sound region um, from all different backgrounds, folks who had immigrated from many different places. Um, and it was really challenging to find evaluation tools that were appropriate for those uh, communities. Um, another important lesson was learning to, you know, measure really what's important at, you know, a particular stage of testing something out, testing a new innovation out. Um, I think in the beginning, there was a tendency to um, kind of follow a typical research um, approach, which would be measure lots and lots and lots of things at the beginning, do the, um, do the new service or the new, um, uh, the new approach, and then measure all those things at the end. And I think what we actually did was end up not necessarily measuring the effectiveness uh, or the or or sort of the acceptability and feasibility of some of those um, new strategies, we ended up measuring sort of the acceptability and feasibility of those those new strategies plus like a two hour um, measurement battery at the beginning and a two hour measurement battery at the end. And we what we found was a lot of folks just didn't want to do that. They didn't find it relevant. It was uh, it was a hassle, and so we didn't end up learning as much as we could have had we really simplified and shortened. Uh, those evaluation tools and 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 really involved the community in selecting what those were and making sure that they felt relevant and people understood um, sort of why we were measuring what we were measuring. Okay, so um, I think I want to just uh, summarize a little bit and then uh, we can go back to panel. Um, so, you know, I think my key points here are um, again, to just aff affirm what's already been said that families and communities should be involved in measurement selection um, and should be at the table sharing power and how those measurements are used. Um, I, I think we would benefit from more common metrics across different program models so that we could begin to learn which of those is more effective for whom and in which contexts. Um, I think um, working toward greater precision and clarity in the ways um, you know, in which we believe programs are effective. So really focusing on those active ingredients um, and then finding ways to measure those active ingredients within programs. So not just measuring outputs and outcomes, but how do we actually get to those outcomes? Um, how are we, uh, how are we um, really paying attention to those key ingredients? Um, and then let's look for ways to continue to improve services. You know, evidence-based programs are a great start um, and let's not be satisfied there. Let's continue to push the field forward um, and, and take a really smart approach to learning and evaluation. So I'm gonna stop there. Um, I'm I, I had an opportunity to sort of test drive the aver an, a, a version of the EC Prism platform this summer. Um, and I got really excited about it. Um, I'm glad that it's going to be available for use soon and that it'll continue to be developed. Um, I think it's going to be a really helpful uh, tool in addressing um, at least some of the issues that I that I uh, called attention to. So thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jason. Before I turn it over to Phil, I just have to reflect on a few things that you said. First of all, thank you for reinforcing the implementation issues that we really need to learn more about. It goes key ingredients to these programs that we need to understand more. And secondly, that, you know, I think we've, we've been moving over the last few years from black box evaluation to formative assessments that are more ongoing and are tools to improvement rather than this, you know, gotcha mentality. And finally, I think we need a lot more discussion about what are we doing in programs to alleviate stress on families rather than putting more stress yeah. on families, which I, I think sometimes we do. Um, and so, so much of what you said, um, we could spend another hour talking about, but let me uh, turn to Phil, who's I know been sitting there and kind of thinking about what, what does all this mean? And uh, I think both of us have a, had a very emotional reaction to the amazing comments. Bill. Yes, indeed, Joan. And uh, first of all, let me thank you for, for moderating this session. 
uh, as always, your words of wisdom are really important guides for the field uh, in how to think about these crucial issues. And also let me thank my fellow panelists and of course, Portia and Brenda, who's gonna follow for, um, I know what will be also amazing words of wisdom. I'll keep my remarks brief, but I, I really just want to um, reinforce the points that have already been made, which is I, I think the intentions behind the efforts to embrace evidence as a way to promote well-being in families by selecting programs that have potential to be impactful uh, historically was a well-intentioned effort. And at the same time, like so many of the other issues that are really ingrained in the fabric of our field, I think they bring with them issues that need to be addressed and have needed to be addressed for a very long time that have everything to do with equity and disparities and the way in which we haven't really acknowledged these, not just societally, but then more specifically within our field. And I think these, these comments are really shining a light on all of how that has evolved. I think it's not necessary to tear down what we have come to see as the gold standards of evidence. There will always be a place for randomized trials uh, to evaluate program impacts. Uh, there, there are clear reasons why those kinds of approaches uh, are seen as the most scientifically rigorous. And at the same time, by singly embracing those in the kind of high stakes gotcha kinds of approaches that have been described, we essentially have dis disenfranchised a vast portion of the early childhood field in being able to participate and, and own the question of what, what program impacts mean. And I think by doing so, we've really just limited the extent to which community-based programs, novel programs uh, can really flourish. I think we've, we've kind of tied the hands of policymakers who uh, feel like they have to avoid the risks of innovation and can only implement programs that come with the, the stamp of, of evidence. And I, I just think what, what the future, in the immediate future holds for us is a need, and this is hopefully part of that larger effort, to redefine what we mean by evidence and what we mean by evaluation. Evaluation should be about tools for learning and for constantly driving forward to be able to support the well-being of families, to be able to have programs reach more people more effectively uh, and to promote optimal outcomes and not simply be you know, a ticket to funding, whether it's philanthropic funding or, or public funding. And that doesn't mean that evidence is irrelevant. It just means that evidence needs to be democratized. The tools for obtaining it need to be democratized. How we define it needs to be democratized. Well, there have been many really rich conversations that I've had. David Willis has been one of the people at the table around this. You know, Even concepts that have been at the center of our field, like attachment, are really typically conceived of from a 1970s white middle-class lens. And you know, it's very hard to envision how we can evaluate programs when we're bringing concepts that are part of it, that are ingrained in our measures that are very limited in their focus and haven't evolved uh, from the get-go in terms of how we think about these things. So by putting a stake in the ground around, here is a repository of measures in the field, one of the things that we're hoping we'll be able to do is drive people to a place of access where they can decide for themselves from what's available according to the dimensions that Tyson showed when he put up that diamond-shaped model of what's important to them. And that means that if it's important to you that your the measures you're selecting have been validated in the context of the communities in which your program exists, 
that you can prioritize that when you're looking at the measures. That's incredibly important. But it also means we're not simply saying, here's the whole compendium, your only choices are what's in it. And that's, that's the, the, way, the end of the story. We truly hope that this will empower those who have ideas about what need to be measured to begin to develop those measures and to add those measures to the repository. And that this will be a field building tool so that we can grow measurement from the ground up rather than from the top down in ways that will continue to accelerate the extent to which the perspectives that don't necessarily come directly from academia can be an equal player in the landscape of evaluation. That is really our sort of our hope and dream behind this. And so I, I hope that everybody will see when we get to the launch of the impact repository that it's simply a starting point. I think too many of these initiatives are like, we're ready, we're here, we've reached the finish line, go, everybody, we're good to go. And we see this as just a beginning to the process of how we can essentially make measurement a, a very different process, redefine what we mean by evidence, and really change how we think about uh, how resources are allocated as a result. Um, to be able to optimally support families in the context of early childhood. We hope this will be a, a tool that's useful for program developers. We also hope that it's a tool for community organizations. We also hope that it'll be a tool for policymakers and private funders who are trying to help their fundees develop more adequate learnings about what's working for whom and why. And so that's really the goal behind this. And I'm just so personally full of gratitude for everybody who's participated, both as speakers and as attendees uh, to this uh, presentation, because I think it really does represent the groundswell of interest in these kinds of approaches and hopefully will we'll provide uh, momentum as we continue to move forward on this really important work. So we still have a little time. So I want to come back to Stephanie um, before I turn to you about you know, your comment about what success means, I do want to pick up on just two things that Phil mentioned. You know, this repository is not like going shopping in a supermarket and you pick up an item. That's, that's not really the image here. This is going to be interactive. So you have to pick something, look at how its key elements talk to the people that help put this together. This is interactive and it's also living so that if you're, if you're experiencing something with a measure that you provide that feedback so that the next generation of people that look at that measure can learn from you. So this is you know, an interactive experience they're about to launch and uh, you know, it'll be a journey. So Stephanie, let me go back to you about this mismatch that we often see be, between what a program is meant to do and the tools they pick to measure that. And what does really success look like, particularly in a, in a multilingual setting? Yeah. So yeah, regarding the success piece, I think a lot in, in my world, um, often success has been pitch to mean English. You have to be an English speaker. You have to use it and know how to read in it and all of that, right? Um, and when I think if we were to have conversations um, that were broader, um, uh, that would help us to think about success in different ways, like it did for me, that success can also mean um, being able to communicate with my family. Success also means whatever in whatever way that works. And and frankly, I, um, I'm, I continue to grow in this area. I've more recently, I had colleagues reach out who are um, working with children that are deaf and hard of hearing, and pushed me to think even further about not just the languages kids are hearing, but um, the fact that they're not just spoken languages that are important as well. So I think about those children too, that what success means for kids who don't have access to spoken language, but visual languages and, and others. So um, I think, yeah, what success means has to start, has to start um, with the, these families themselves and they have to, to Portia's point and others, they'll help us define what that is. And we can't decide for them. We have to decide with them at the table. 
and they have to be sensitive. You know, I think if you would have asked my parents, they would have said, make sure she learns English. Mm-hmm. Yes. Would have said. And and yet, you know, 70 years later, here I am not, you know, having the facility that I'd like in the home language. So, you know, that wasn't successful really. And so bringing people along and not having, <clears throat> not assuming we have the answer, I, I think is key. Um, and I think you said something important there too, Joan, about thinking in the thinking in the future as well. So for a lot of times we, we come in and we say English is important, and then it might take the place of that home language. But um, I did need my home language too for lots of social and important reasons. And so I think for us also thinking about what is success now, but what is success in the future? What are you going to need to be successful functionally in the future as well? Yeah. Um, I, I want to thank you for that, and thank you for your work. Uh, that this is an issue that, again, we shouldn't leave the dual language issue to a small group of people on the side. This is a mainstream issue, and it's got to be integrated, just the way any other equity issue is integrated into our programming and our measurement. Um, I'm going to ask a kind of odd question of both Phil and Tyson, and that is. There's a several terms here. There's the impact center, there's the tools, there's EC prison. Prism, can you help us sort out the language? How do you want us to talk about this project? Really I, a great question, Joan. I've asked you this before, but it struck me in the middle of the of the panel. Yeah, and it's interesting because there have been a couple of, of uh, comments posted in the chat about this. I'll, I'll say something quickly, but Tyson, I also think people should hear from you. Um, the, the repository is one piece of a suite of tools that we're developing, and they're very tied to uh, this broader uh, sort of framework, which is the PRISM, the EC PRISM framework. The PRISM framework is specifically designed to provide support and technical assistance around measurement and impact evaluation, and it includes tools that help with the development of a theory of impact, which sometimes is referred to elsewhere as theory of change or conceptual model. It definitely uh, refers to the kind of technical assistance that we provide to help tie the theory of impact to the selection of measures, and then to the kinds of decisions that have to be made around the type of evaluation designs that are reflective of the kind of formative processes that people have been talking about. All of these things go together. And one of the things that we've seen actually with some of the other compendia of measures in the field is that if they're not, if they're just sort of a a gigantic list, it doesn't really help with the progress that needs to be made in the the whole question of how you go about uh, selecting measures, using them, what do you do when you get data, how do you construe the ev- the evidence that you're accruing and how do you use it for these subsequent iterations? So very much so, these things are all part of a larger whole. Tyson, what else would you say about this? Tyson, you're on mute. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, no, I, I think as Phil was saying, we see this as uh, the, the tool is a, a complementary piece of, of the technical assistance um, and, and consulting around measurement and evaluation that we provide. The way we often think of it is that the, the, the path toward improvement and impact is not necessarily a, a direct kind of research science to practice approach, but it also includes embedding science-based tools within practice. And that is one of the, 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 the missing piece what we often see that's lacking is how do we provide tools that simplify decision-making processes. So the tool is based on high scientific evidence on what makes a good measure. And I, I won't bore anyone with the number of scientific terms like psychometrics that go into the scoring system, but, but that information is then distilled in a way for those who don't need to know that level of detail, but can know that they're making good decisions on high quality measures that not only are high quality for, um, for, for everyone, but also high quality for various contexts and communities, um, which is a, a piece that we've seen that's lacking. The related part as well, usability. So how do we rate measures and, and kind of quantify just usage of like, can this be done quickly and efficiently? And again, those are all 
all decisions that have to be made within, within a, a program and a practice and for practitioners. And we see that kind of as the, of, a, of a tool among that larger framework. But we should refer to this as EC prism rather than those individual pieces, right? I'm going to do that. I'm going to, because I think the term is going to be important in communicating this. So these are all great points. Katie, I'm going to turn to you to see if you can tell us if there's some questions coming in from the chat. Absolutely. Thanks, Joan. Um, so the first question that we have here is from Revere Joyce. Um, and I just want to highlight that um, Portia has added a response in the chat as well. So Portia, if you would like to uh, jump in and add anything further, please feel free. Um, so the question from Revere is, uh, how do you measure family engagement beyond attendance? Oh, yes, I wrote a long note in the chat box. Hope I didn't insult you, whoever you are out there, uh, by starting with basics. And what I did offer also is to send um, uh, information at least about the approach and how to operationalize the approach from an educare learning network perspective. But what I said in the chat is, is something that seems very simple, but sometimes I find in early childhood we overlook. First of all, we have to, if we want to help parents help their children learn, we have to build a relationship with the parent. And I have found, not everywhere, but I have found sometimes in early childhood, we tend to skip that part and go straight to the teachers, I mean, to the children. And the parent is not an intervention for us to get our work done in the classroom. The parent is the context and the powerful influencer of the learning. So what we've got to do in addition to, you know, being our best practitioner self in the classroom We've got to build an adult relationship with that parent, which means you've got to get to know her wishes and desire for herself as a person and for her child. The parent needs to know that not only do you care about her child, but you care about her who, or him or whoever they are. And that it, it, there are things you can do in, in just in your approach to build that relationship because I believe if you build that learning respectful relationship, then we can talk about what other things that uh, families can do to contribute to their learning, but they're not going to hear that unless you know them and it won't stick. So it's a, it, it's a long hundred page manual on that and, and I'm happy to send it to you. But I mean, that's my first thought, and I don't know if that's applicable to what uh, the person who raised the question is about, but I, I found sometimes in my experience, when I look deeply at what people are saying, it's like, with parents, and we, how do we make them? They ain't showing up for the activity. Now, do we have a relationship with them? <laughs> Maybe that's the evaluation. I think this whole well, conversation about family assessment and yeah. assessing our work with families, um, not yeah. us families. Um, it, we could do a whole webinar on it, and I think we're going to turn to your guidance over the next few years, Portia, to help guide that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, other questions, Katie? Yes, we do have a few more. Um, so we, we did receive a question um, from Sheridan Green. This was um, directed specifically to EOMA, but I think other folks might have things to share as well. So the question is, um, Ioma, I very much appreciate the prospect of measuring what children and families are bringing in addition to what they need. This may be deeper than attempts at strengths-based measurement. Do you have any thoughts about what this expansion or change might look like? And Jason also touched on that. So I don't know if you want to answer that or, or Stephanie. Strength-based. Yeah, just about, sorry, the question was about strength-based measurement and just how, how kind of how we think about that. Um, for me, it, it, it starts from square one. Um, actually, it, I think um, Portia and others made this point too, like the, the power of observation. Um, 
And sometimes it's as simple as, as starting there, just observing uh, um, what, what the success means for this family or this child, um, and rather than coming in with some predisposed ideas about that, um, but actually taking a step back. So it, it, that's where it starts for me, taking a step back and then having those conversations with stakeholders, but being really clear that you're like about your limitations, that the, the tools you're bringing with you, the perspectives you're bringing with you, where do those come from? Thinking critically about those, um, who created those, and am I bringing those to the table? And if not, why? And um, so to me, th that re reiterates some of the points you're making earlier as well, just about the power of observation and thinking about where these are current standing is. and and and. Um, it really is about the, the critical piece. Um, also, starting with your yourself. A lot of the, a lot of times, I, we when I have these conversations with students and training them to go out and do this as speech language pathologists. And often, one of the basic activities is just asking yourself, "What is your cultural perspective? What do you? What is you know? What 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 um, influences your lens? Because when we also come, when we recognize that we come in with predispositions about what we see as a strength or what we see as a fault." Um, if we can understand what that is, then we're better able to mitigate that in the moment. So I think it's multiple things, but those are a couple of thoughts that come to mind. Great. That's great. Katie, I think we have time for one more quick question. Do we? That sounds great. So we do have one more question that we can ask here. This question is from Akila Nakanti. And so her question is uh, related to the danger of a single story. She says, I found that some advocates worry that highlighting negative experiences within certain groups, e.g. experiences of child abuse in non-white families, may result in those findings being used to pathologize those groups and set advocacy groups back by several steps. So how can we ensure that by highlighting the unique lived experiences of our participants, we do not harm these communities? Uh, and I know Ioma put some response to that in the chat, but I'd open it up for any other final comment. Well, I, I'm just, I'd like to channel what Portia taught me in the last, you know, period of time that we've been working together, which is that what's important is contextualizing the experience, yeah. that simply putting data out there that say, this group looks worse than that group, or there are more challenges being faced by that group than this group just reinforces all of the preconceived stereotypes that may exist. But when you talk about why, this came up in our rapid survey early on when we had a finding that showed that black households were using less medical care than other households. Yes. And the immediate concern was, is if we, if we make note of this in our postings and our blog postings, is that just gonna reinforce a, a, a concept or a thinking that black households don't care as much about their children? And you know, the, the clear antidote to that was to describe what black households and black people in general have experienced at the hands of the medical system historically, and that there's not a lot of trust there in many communities and rightly so. And so, I think the the understanding of it's simply we're just we're just researchers we're just you know putting out the information is really I think a, a morally bankrupt perspective. It, it's without context, information is meaningless, and with context, you really can fight against some of those things. So Portia, I don't know if I if I correctly represented the learnings that I've taken away from these conversations, but I'm I'm hoping that I got it somewhat right. And I'd really welcome your additional thoughts. She, she's smiling. So I'm gonna take that smile as affirmation because I know we're just about out of time, but I can't think of a better way to end this panel, which has been amazing. And I think we all thank you panelists for the, those remarks with this conversation about cultural context and how important it is in both programming and measurement. Um, again, I want to thank you, but I, I'm going to make one final plea and take the prerogative of the moderator, <clears throat> and that is that, you know, as a public official, I had to implement policies that were developed by policy makers and decision makers that didn't really understand measurement. So I'm urging Phil and Tyson to really bring these messages to the policy makers so we don't get, you have to use this kind of evidence or you won't get funding. 
or you have to use this measure or we'll close you down and get this result. Uh, those days should be over. We should use measurement as a tool for program improvement, community improvement. And I think the early childhood prism effort will help that. 